everybody. So today what we're going to talk about uh, is hippies. Now, I always like to get you super hyped in because everybody loves to hear about hippies. Uh, spoiler alert, it's going to be a big spoiler. Uh, it's it's going to be a big letdown. Hippies are, are nothing special. There's just a ton of them because they're the baby boom generation. So we're going to start talking about uh, the late 60s, early 70s time period here. Uh, so Vietnam War is absolutely going on. There are some other things that are taking place in the United States. The civil rights movement has really opened people's minds to the fact that not everybody's treated equal in America. And there's a big push for equal rights on a lot of different fronts at this time period. Uh, and a lot of people who were not treated the same as everybody else start gaining more rights. So we're going to start talking about uh, those people today. So Latinos. Uh, in America, so what happens um, is in Southwest the United States, this is like Arizona, New Mexico, California, uh, especially in California, there are a lot of Hispanic workers down there. The vast majority are going to be Mexican Americans, but because there's going to be some from El Salvador and, and, and other places like that, Guatemala, uh, Latinos is the term we use uh, to not exclude anybody. Um, there are a lot of field workers in uh, Southwest the United States. Uh, Hispanic workers that are here illegally on visas and all that. All right, I'm not talking about any illegal immigration thing here. Uh, completely legal workers that are here are not being paid as much as white workers. Uh, even though the production is expected to be higher uh, among Hispanics um, at the time, they are not being paid as much as white workers. So, they are going to unionize. And this happens in multiple places uh, around the world where there's an attempt. The most effective one that we're going to talk about is the unionization of Latinos in California in the grape industry. Now, grapes are used for a bunch of different things. Uh, I, I could be wrong on this. I believe the majority of grape making uh, is turned into wine. <laughs> like the majority of grapes. Uh, the specific industry we're going to talk about are table grapes. So this is the industry where they actually uh, uh, harvest grapes for um, for you to eat from the grocery store, J just eating grapes. In that industry, the vast majority of workers in the field are Hispanic. However, they're not being treated nearly as what, not that being a field worker is an easy job, but they are not being paid as much as white workers. So they unionize, and there's a guy named Cesar Chavez who organizes the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, which uh, and it, it creates a union called La Raza Unida, uh, means Mexican Americans United, uh, to fight for more rights. I will have a, a picture here, of, uh, or a, a quick video clip of Cesar Chavez. This is Cesar Chavez. So he says, we expect to be paid the same as white workers. Uh, and the employers are like, no, he's like, fine, we're going to go on strike. And they do in the late sixties, early seventies. in one of those years, I don't know it off the top of my head, they go on strike and you couldn't get table grapes. Like all the grapes got grown, but then they just rotted in the field because there's nobody to go pick them. Uh, they did this to prove the power of, you know, the amount of Hispanic workers. If you don't have Hispanic workers, you're not going to get your grapes. We expect to be paid fairly the same as white workers, and it's going to end up being effective. It is a huge win for the Latino community. This was not the only fight that Latino and Hispanic Americans had uh, to gain equal rights, but it is uh, the most clear-cut victory for Hispanic workers uh, is the union led by Cesar Chavez that got them uh, equal pay. I got a little video of, of Cesar Chavez here. Turn my speaker on and that's not going to work, is it? Another activist leader was Cesar Chavez. Chavez was raised on a migrant farm camp in Arizona. He joined the Navy during World War II. When he got out, he worked for a self-help group. But his true calling was to promote fair working conditions for migrant farm workers. He created the first farm workers union and is shown here with the co-founder of the United Farm Workers, Dolores Huerta. He gained national fame when he led a boycott of California table grapes in 1968 in order to get fair labor contracts for workers. His work gained him the respect and admiration of not only Mexican Americans, but all Americans. So that's Cesar Chavez. All right, 
Native Americans. So this is this is crazy. Um, like we had mentioned this back when um, during the New Deal. Native Americans did not get the right to vote until 1927. Uh, that is that is crazy. It's 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 baffling. I mean, they're the last group in America to have gotten the right to vote, uh, unless you're counting the 18 to 20 year olds that got the right to vote after Vietnam. The last group in America to get the right to vote are the people that were here before America even got started. It's kind of kind of ridiculous on that, but. Native Americans, uh, when they got the right to vote, all of a sudden the government cares about them because they can vote. So they had created the Bureau of Indian Affairs, created by FDR. I genuinely believe, and maybe it's my uh, me being naive uh, and trying to see the good in everything, that this was created to help the Native Americans. First time they're like, "Hey, we actually got to take care of them because they're, uh, you know, they're voters and all <clears throat> and all this other stuff." What it turns into, though, is extremely corrupt and is just trying to hold down Native Americans and manipulate them and, and do other stuff uh, because they're not a really large enough portion of the population to affect any political outcome. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs have gotten very, very corrupt and Native Americans are going to band together at this time and say, nah, ain't going to do it. They create a group called the American Indian Movement. Now, you are going to write a essay, which I believe you've already done. Actually, I'm pretty positive you've already done it. Uh, yeah, you wrote this back uh, at the beginning of May, uh, or the end of April, beginning of May, over Native Americans taking over Alcatraz. This uh, was all part of the American Indian Movement, to basically point out to the world how awful Native Americans are treated in the United States based on how other uh, populations are treated and how they feel like they should get special treatment now whenever you talk about in america people getting special treatment everybody gets squirrely all right however native americans they make a solid point they were here first all right they're not a very big part of the population they're going to do their own things what they want is special treatment is to be left alone all right and they just haven't been so uh the american indian movement comes out in uh, the 1960s, and you can see it, the picture here is a peace sign and an Indian head. So what they do, and this is this is crazy, this is awesome. So uh, they said we want the Bureau of Indian Affairs eliminated, and basically people just ignore them. That they're small enough you can just ignore them. Whatever, we don't care about what you're going through. Da 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 da. So the Native Americans show up to to the Supreme Court. All right, they show up to the courthouse. And they got some papers. And they're like, hey, we got some legal papers here we would like to enforce. And they're like, all right, what are they? So if you remember back in American 1, we had treated the Native Americans really bad. And we kept forcing them off their land. One of the biggest ones was like the Treaty of Greenville, which says Indians have to go on the other side of the Ohio River. And we promised them, hey, y'all can have all that land on the other side of the Ohio River. And we're, we'll never come ask for it. And then we end up taking that land for them, from them. Every time we have forced the Native Americans to move, we've made them at gunpoint sign a contract saying that they will move. Well, all those contracts are signed by the United States government. We've just refused to acknowledge them because we, when we want their land, we just make them sign a new contract. They show up to court in the 1960s with those contracts that are hundreds of years old that promise all this land to them signed by the United States government. Like legally, they win. <laughs> they basically say, yeah, we'd like all the white people to leave. <laughs> and legally speaking, with the way it is written, they're right. It's not until they show up, the American Indian movement is going to show up with these documents and say, all right, leave. We want everybody out of our land. You've given this land to us multiple times, and we have the contracts to prove it. The whole country's like, oh, well, the whole country. Most people weren't really aware of it, but the government's like, okay. Like, obviously, the United States government, you know, will be as shady as they need to be to like not leave because at no point is anybody like, all right, I guess we got to head back to Europe. So they're like, okay, you win this one. What do you want? So it's not until the Native Americans show up with these contracts to say, we want you gone or give us what we want that they finally say, okay, wh what is it that you want? And Native Americans, it's only in the late 60s, early 70s that Native Americans finally get some unique respect from the United States government. Native Americans say, 
we want our own reservations. And America's like, we've tried the reservation thing before. You hate it. They're like, no, no, no. We want to pick our land. Like, you can't just, like, and they're like, we'll be, we're not trying to start a war with you. We're going to pick a land that's in the middle of nowhere. We're not going to pick, like, New York City and be like, we want this back. Uh, they, they want to just have their own culture and their own society and not have America be all up in their business. So the United States government's like, fine, and they allow Native Americans to choose their own reservations where they can have their own laws and stuff. Uh, they are not subject to state laws. Uh, there is some oversight by the federal government, like they can't create an army and like attack, you know, that, that there's, there's rules, uh, but they're very, very lax. And basically the United States says, as long as y'all don't cause any problems, we won't make any problems. So these reservations spring up around the country uh the most famous one here is cherokee in the mountains of north carolina is the cherokee reservation so if you want to live on the cherokee reservation you actually have to be a cherokee indian like they are complete control of that um of who gets to live on the reservation and, and who doesn't uh the reason i mentioned the cherokee reservation is because so in north carolina gambling is illegal like casinos and stuff that's illegal however if you really want to go gamble in North Carolina, there is a big, massive casino. It looks like a little mini Las Vegas up in the mountains on the Cherokee Reservation because they're not under state law. So it's called uh, Harrah's, Harrah's, H-A-R-R-A-H-S. It's in the mountains of North Carolina. Big old casino. You can drive up there. They have like a road that goes like into the casino. Like they made a road. So you can come on the reservation. You take the road that comes into the reservation. It goes directly to the casino. It's like one way in and out. They don't want you hanging out in the, in the reservation. They really frown at where they live at. But that casino is on the reservation. You go into the casino. It's like being in Las Vegas. And th then you leave, go, go out the same road that you came in on. And uh, they gamble. So casinos make money. You typically do not win at casinos. You lose a lot more than you make. Some people make it rich, but usually you lose your money. So they take all the profits they make from that casino and divvy it up among the Cherokee Indians. Uh, and, and they still do that today. Even if you don't live on the reservation, you still get a cut of the profits if you're, uh, if you're a certain percentage Cherokee to uh, present day from that casino. Uh, so these are some of, the things, some of the wins that the American Indian movement were able to achieve and finally get treated uh, with some respect at the time. I do not think I have a video on this one. It's kind of a bummer. Uh, where, where's my mouse at? Where, don't be weird. Where, there we go. My mouse wanted to disappear. No. Nope. All right. So, women for equality. The feminist movement is going to come out here in the 1960s. Now, let me set the stage for you here. So you hear feminism today. A lot of people do an eye roll. They're like, oh, they want to like crush men, whatever. No, feminism is just that women want to be treated equal as men. Like, that's it. All right. And you're like, well, they are. Like, right? so present day, there are there are still some differences between men and women. Uh, let me give you an example. Present day. All right. And I I, I learned this from experience with, with my mom. Uh uh, and this is, this is crazy. Did you know in 2020 in North Carolina, if you're a woman and you're married, you cannot buy real estate property without your husband saying it's okay. Can't do it. Can't do it. If you're a man and you're married, you can buy property and your wife doesn't have to say okay. But if you're a woman today and you're married and you want to go buy a house, your husband has to agree to it. Those laws still exist. Uh, and I imagine, I say that, I know that was the fact in 2000 and probably 10 or 11. It may have changed since then. And, and if you Google it and it, it has come up, but as of uh, uh, within the last 10 years, that has been the law and has always been the law. And I, I haven't heard it being, uh, people, a lot of those laws people aren't really aware of and there's not a big push. So the first time somebody makes a stink about it, they're like, oh, that's a law? Oh yeah, let's get rid of it. <clears throat> but, uh, that, that, that's crazy. So these laws still exist. So in the 1960s, the laws were, were much crazier. So women finally said, we're tired of laying down. Uh, we're tired of being walked all over by a society that doesn't value women as equal. We have the right to vote. 
uh, and all these other things. I'll give you uh, one of the examples that you may have already seen in the RNGOC book uh, questions, and it was a, like a wrong answer, and you're like, ha, 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 but it's a real thing. That in, in the 1960s, all right, uh, up to 1965, uh, birth control pills were illegal. Think about that. So they'd created birth control pills in 1960, but they were illegal. All right. Like in Connecticut, birth control was just completely illegal. Women were allowed to have it. Uh, uh, condoms and stuff, stuff for men for birth control, that was fine. Birth control for women, no. That was immoral somehow. Uh, so society was very different in the 1960s uh, for women. Women uh, uh, absolutely were treated as an inferior uh, uh, group because women are moving into the workforce uh, and when they're just they're just treated as an inferior sex in the 1960s absolutely are so there's a handful of women that come out that are going to fight for equal rights all right in the 1960s uh probably the most famous is betty frieden she wrote the feminine mystique betty frieden is a hammer all right uh she is not a fun time she's not going to come charm you all right uh she's tough and she adamantly talks about, she's like, I'm not a likable person. Like she, 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 she says that she's like, yeah, I'm not a likable person. Uh, I hope everybody hates me, but what I want to do is I'm going to put out, I'm going to fight for feminism. All right. I'm going to go out here and lead women and be on the front lines of this. And I want to take all the lightning from everybody. But what I'm putting out there are these ideas that women are, are, are afraid to put out the, the things that women believe in are being uh, paid the same equal rights and things like that. I'm going to be the one that puts that out there and I will take the lightning, but hopefully I'm leading a path for other women. So uh, Betty Friedman, and I got a picture of her. She's, she's, she's a tough woman. And I, I got a, a video of her, of her talking and she's, uh, she ain't here to make friends. <laughs> she, she is not, she ain't going to try to charm nobody and get anything done. She is a, a very aggressively speaking woman and it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but that's, that was, that was her thing. Like she was like, I have to put it out there. I have to like, Shock people because women are supposed to be seen, not heard, be in the background. That ain't Betty Frieden. Betty Frieden's gonna be on the front line and, she, and, and she's gonna challenge you on things that have existed a certain way for a really long time. And by doing so, she is able to get these ideas out there uh, that then uh, other leaders can grow on. So Betty Frieden is the leader of uh, of the women's movement. When you look back on it, it was, was kind of like Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't like the single leader of the civil rights movement, but he's one of the most famous ones. It's kind of how, how Betty Frieden is as far as if you had to pick one to talk about, Betty Frieden's a, a pretty solid one to talk about. She creates the National Organization for Women called NOW. Uh, uh, she uh, also writes a book called The Feminine Mystique. And so here's what Betty Frieden says. She says, all women are not happy being housewives. That's, they're, they're just not. Not all women are. And she's like, look, there are women that are. There are women who want to raise a family. There are women who uh, who want to stay at home that want to have the traditional roles in society. That's fine. She's like, I'm, I don't have a problem with you. She's like, this movement isn't about you, though, all right, other than the fact it gives you more options if you change your mind. Uh, she says th that structure in society is already set up. What I'm fighting for is the women who want to go out and be doctors and lawyers and the other things in society should have the right to. And so Betty Frieden says a lot of women are unhappy being forced to be a housewife. There are women who enjoy being a housewife, but there's a lot that don't. And she is here to fight for the, uh, uh, for those women. So I got, I got a, a, uh, a video here of Betty Frieden. And, and again, uh, this, uh, she comes across abrasive and that is, that is her personality and she acknowledges it. And click. Oh, I do not have it. Ah. Oh. Come on, self. I guess I guess I don't. I I, I lied. Uh, but she she is a uh, again very uh, uh, aggressive in the way that that she uh, says things and does things. Uh, almost purposely rubbing people the wrong way. Uh, but she's like that's just who I am. It is what I am. All right. <clears throat> Uh, more stuff here for uh, for women. Uh, Gloria Steinman uh, began the magazine Miss. That term, uh, I talk about the magazine because it's a term that comes out in the 60s and it has really stuck today. 
So prior to using the term miss, just MS period, when you're talking about a woman like miss so-and-so, uh, a woman was either miss, M-I-S-S, -S, or Mrs. M-R-S, period, all right? So if you saw somebody's name on paper you are getting ready to meet, and it was a woman, you knew before you even met her whether she was already legally connected to a man by if her name was Miss M-I-S-S -S, or Mrs. M-R-S. So you already knew if she was married or not before you ever even met her. Men don't have this. They are Mr. That doesn't change. So women moving into the workforce start using the term Miss, M-S period, the same way men use Mr. So that it doesn't matter if they're married or not. They're just letting you know that they're a woman. It doesn't matter if they are, are married. So uh, Miss becomes a feminist term because it equates with Mr. Uh, as being the same. And Gloria Steinman, also part of the feminist movement, creates the magazine Miss. Uh, Roe v. Wade huge this is the one that uh legalizes abortion in the united states crazy controversial up to present day it was a five to four decision saying that women are allowed to, to have an abortion this comes on the heels of a lot of creating birth control uh or allowing birth control uh, to, to be legal so roe v wade is extremely controversial today uh i i, I do not do any like some teachers are courageous enough to like have debates in their class over the pros and cons of Roe v. Wade. Uh, this this teacher is is not. Uh, typically, uh, people who care about Roe v. Wade uh, will fight to the death on their belief system on their side of it, right? Uh, and the, you, you're not going to like change anybody's mind uh, on their their belief system. So this is the thing that happened, and I'm moving on from it because it's it's like a uh, ticking time bomb typically in class to to try to have it because people usually feel so strongly one way or the other that it's uh, it, it, it can get crazy. So, uh, but Roe v. Wade at the time is considered a win for uh, women's rights. It was a very close decision. It was five to four uh, it was at the Supreme Court to, uh, to allow this, and it still causes controversy today um, over uh, the abortion topic. Uh, so a lot of women wanted the Equal Rights Act passed, all right, uh, the ERA. The Equal Rights Act would make like a, basically a constitutional amendment that says men and women 100% have to be treated the same. Now, uh, it has never passed. It has come up multiple times, even as a law, and it has never passed. And the reason is, is the main opponents, the people against the women's rights movement, are other women. Now, that might seem crazy to you, but here's the logic, all right? There's a lot of women that come out and say, well, hold on now, all right? If men and women are treated exactly the same, that's not necessarily always going to be a good thing because there are laws in America that help women. Maternity leave, all right? Uh, women can't be fired from their job if they take uh, six weeks off of work after they have a baby, all right? Uh, if men take six weeks off, they can be fired. All right. Uh, but if you, so if you made it the same, they could say everybody has to come right back to work and it can hurt women. Uh, another one is at the at, to present day. I don't, this could change if it ever happens again, but women are exempt from the draft. If you, if you turn around and you make it equal rights for everybody, then you would have to draft women too. That that's an argument against the ERA by women. Uh, another one is a lot of domestic violence laws and custody, uh, laws are in favor of women. Women realize if you go at the ERA, they lose a lot of those protections under the law. And so the ERA has never passed. The, the Equal Rights Act has never passed because there are laws out there that, uh, that benefit women that would change if you uh, pass the ERA. Uh, there is a woman who is adamantly against the women's rights movement. Her name is Phyllis Shafley. Phyllis Shafley... Uh, she says uh, that she's against the ERA for basically the reasons that I just said. It would be, lead to the uh, drafting of women and the abolition of laws that protect uh, housewives. Nope. All right. So, hippies. We have to talk about hippies because they're the baby boomers. That's it. 
Uh, everybody's like, man, hippies are so good. Everybody's like smoking pot and like free love and like. I mean, that's may, may not be, but they're, they're no different. There is no difference in the teenagers in the late 1960s and the early 1970s in you. They're, 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 there's not. They're not special. They're not unique. They're not an individual snowflake. They're not a unique butterfly. Uh, there's just a ton of them. They're, I mean, it's the baby boom generation. The largest part of the population has now become teenagers. So... Anything they do was influential throughout their entire existence because there's just so dang many boomers, right? At this point in time, hippies uh, is a term given to uh, people in, in America. Uh, it's just, it, I don't know. There used to be, man, I'm so out of it now on what uh, types of cliques are and stuff in, in, in high school. Like, it used to be like gothic stuff and your preppy people and whatever. Uh, the hippies would just like fall into a category like that, but it was a large category. So the reason the hippies exist is the same reason teenagers really do anything. Uh, it's a rebellion against their parents. So you know who ends up writing the textbooks now? The baby boomers. So when they look back on it, they're like, oh yeah, we called hi ourselves hippies then, but let's, let's church it up now to make it sound like we really had like a movement here. Uh, and so in the history books, they call themselves the counterculture. So who was the culture that they were being the opposite of? Their parents. Their parents were the greatest generation, the ones who fought in World War II. So like if you, th if, if you think about their guy, uh, th their dad, typical dad, World War II veteran, all right? They live in a Levittown. Everything's exactly the same. Men go to work. They wear black suits, black ties, uh, white shirts, uh, very close cut haircuts. They're, you know, they stand up against communism. They're going to be the ones that uh, uh, support the Korean War. They're going to be the ones that support the Vietnam War. Uh, so, what is the complete opposite, all right, of structure, of bland clothing and close cut haircuts? Oh, I don't know why I thought this was. Where's my boy at? Where's my boy at? There he is. That's what it is. It's the complete opposite of their parents. It's called the counterculture. It's it's kids rebelling against their parents. That's that that's all it is. So I taught, and, and it's wearing off now. I taught their kids. All right. So I taught the baby boomers, uh, the later generation baby boomers. So all these hippies, when they grow up, and they all have kids, and then they come to my class at 17 years old. So this is all peace, love, and happiness. You know what they are? All this black makeup and black gothic stuff. And it's like, oh, life is awful. You know, the entire emo scene. That's what it was. Rebelling against their parents. This is this is what happened. So hopefully at some point I'm going to teach all their kids and they're going to show up in a shirt and tie and be like, I love life. Uh, who knows? Uh, but typically uh, teenagers culture is just a complete rebellion to whatever their parents are. And uh, since all their parents were the same, all of their rebellion to try to be different from their parents all happened to look exactly the same. As weird as that sounds. So they all rebelled the exact same way because all their parents were the same. So the hippies uh, were a uh, peace, love, happiness, whatever. Uh, and, we and we have to talk about it because they, it was a large part of teenagers. There's nothing special about the hippies. They, they do not fundamentally change America other than the fact it is the largest population in America are teenagers. So that's why we talk about them. Biggest thing happening in America were the teenagers. So here's some of the, the random stuff that they expect you to know about hippies, which again, nothing more special than you are. Uh, it starts in San Francisco. I, I don't understand, like, this idea like peace, love, happiness. I don't know why it has a starting point, but they love to say it's the height Ashbury uh center of San Francisco, that part of San Francisco must just been like nothing but hippies, I guess. Uh, there were some cool stuff that did come out. In this. Now, one thing you cannot deny, and now this is, this I, I didn't live through this time, all right? I'm not that old. So I can say this objectively because I, I didn't live through it. I can look at them both with fresh eyes. The music in the 60s and 70s was outstanding absolutely outstanding uh so th there there's no question that the music that came out of the 60s and 70s was special all right uh th they did a whole bunch of stuff that was new and it was awesome uh 
kind of the soundtrack to the entire hippie movement were the Beatles, which is this huge, mega, awesome rock uh, uh, thing. Uh, probably the kind of the pinnacle of the whole hippie movement was there's this huge free uh, event in 1969 called Woodstock. It was a big free concert, and everybody showed up, and every major band that you've ever heard of at the time uh, showed up. Every like A lister showed up and basically played for free. It was it was absolutely. Awesome. And then it rained. It was like three days, and it rained, and nobody cared. And like, well, yeah, everything's awesome. Uh, so people look back on the hippie movement and usually point to Woodstock as kind of the pinnacle of that. Uh, it was short-lived. Shocker, because you know what ended up happening? They grew up and got jobs. So, uh, but this is why we have to stop and talk about hippies, is because when they hit that 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old age that you guys are in, it was the biggest, biggest thing happening in America at the time, uh, as far as culturally. And also keep in mind, uh, the people fighting in Vietnam would like to be hippies instead. Uh, so Vietnam is happening simultaneously with all this. Got a video clip here of Woodstock. Underground newspapers, head shops, and free clinics soon transformed old neighborhoods in many cities. Mystical religions from the East became popular. The Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's program of transcendental meditation attracted thousands of followers. Rock festivals drew huge crowds in the late 60s. The biggest was Woodstock. Nearly half a million kids jammed onto a 600-acre dairy farm near Woodstock, New York in August 69 to dance, sing, smoke, and make love. Despite shortages of food and water and heavy rainstorms, Woodstock was a peaceful celebration. From now on, we would call these kids the Woodstock Generation. This is a, a picture of Woodstock. So I think there's a movie out that came out a few years ago about Woodstock. Uh, I have not seen it, but uh, I heard it was pretty good for, of, of how it got presented. Because Woodstock is just in the middle of nowhere in, in upstate New York. Uh, so they basically just built it in the middle of a big field that had like nothing and everybody showed up uh, as, a, as a pretty big ordeal. All right, that's as far as we're going to get. I will see you guys tomorrow. Beep.